Why postmodernists train, not educate, activists? Now here's why indoctrinating children and young people makes perfect sense to postmodernists and those trained in postmodern theory. Now most of us have encountered old-fashioned indoctrinators in our education. We almost always run into a teacher or two along the way or a professor who thinks like this, you know, there's one truth and I am in possession of it. So important is it that students must believe it and it alone. Alternative ideas are a waste of time and they are a temptation to unformed minds. So those should be shunned. So as a teacher, I will use my authority and my power to instill only the correct ideas. Now, our modern ideal of liberal education fought a long battle against that view across several centuries. Now, it also agrees that the truth matters, but the truth is often very complex, and the exposure of students to contending theories is an absolutely essential part of the process. Students need to need on complicated matters, particularly controversial issues, need to know what the leading alternative theories and hypotheses are, and exposing them to the leading advocates for each of those contenders is the best way for students to sort it out. Students also need to develop their own strength of mind, to be able to think independently with confidence, because all through their lives, they're going to be exposed to new, complex issues for which there's not yet an answer in the back of the book or an authority figure who can just tell them what it is. That's what they're going to be dealing with their lives, and that's what education should prepare them for. Now, John Stuart Mill, in his uh, classic work, now classic uh, statement of the liberal education ideal, this is from his On Liberty, particularly chapter two, they argue passionately that students must learn not only the best answers, but also their contenders, even the failed contenders, and that a trained mind, and the mark of a trained mind is going to be one that not only knows the truth or knows the best answer, but knows the reasons for the best answer, and also knows the strongest criticisms that can be mounted against the best answer or the true answer. And not only that, they will also know the contender positions and what the best arguments are for each of those contender positions, and then, of course, how to respond to each of those arguments. So institutionally, then, Mill went on to argue, if that's our idea of what it is to be a well-educated person, uh, what this implies for schools is that schools should make it a point of hiring teachers from diverse viewpoints. For it's only by exposure to expert and passionate articulation of varied viewpoints will students get a first-rate education. Now, uh, I can't resist anecdotally here praising my undergraduate education at the University of Guelph in Canada. It was mostly known as a, a strong university in the biological sciences, but it had a great philosophy department uh, in my experience, and it served me very well. And when I was there for a while, I uh, found out the story of how it came to have. It had 20 professors, I believe, of philosophy. And there wasn't a, a single professor that agreed with any of the other professors on, on any overall philosophical outlook. And what I learned was that the then chairman of the department, uh, Professor Bruce, was his name, John Bruce, I think his first name was, had been a skeptic at the university when the university's department was much smaller, but they realized the baby boom was coming, so he was then authorized to expand the department from, I believe, eight professors up to 20. 
So he basically went to the American Philosophical Association and the Canadian Philosophical Association meetings intending to hire, and he went with a shopping list. And the way he put it was, he said, well, I took stock. Uh, he was a skeptic, so he didn't uh, particularly have any axes to grind. It was to say, you know, I need to have professors who are representative of each of the major traditions in philosophy. So we've got eight professors now. He went through the list of what their outlook was, but then he said, I realize, you know, we need a Nietzschean, we need a Thomas, Right? We need a Platonist, we need a Papirian, and he went through, and he explicitly then hired people based on their ability to contribute to the diversity of the department. So my uh, undergraduate career then was a matter of a large number of philosophy courses. I think I ended up taking 22 courses in philosophy. Many of them were from uh, professors all over the map. And so from the John Stuart Mill perspective, that is the perfect education. Now, that ideal of liberal education with a diverse intellectual faculty and its purpose being to train students to think for themselves about complicated and controversial issues, that did win out. But now we come to our generation, and we are surprised, most of us, by the resurgence right, uh, of angry activism, and much of it seems to be led by large numbers of students and recent graduates who are very confrontational and completely uninterested in debate. And in many cases, they seem to be unaware that there is anything to debate, or they seem to be in a state of disbelief that there really is anything that needs to be debated. They are the products of a new-fashioned indoctrination, and it's one that results from the groundwork laid by now two generations of postmodern ideology. This July, Professor Stephen Hicks is coming to New York. Join him in a live debate discussing whether postmodernism is necessary for a politics of individual liberty. For the negative, Professor of Philosophy at Rockford University, Executive Director of the Centre of Ethics and Entrepreneurship, and Senior Scholar at the Atlas Society, Stephen Hicks is author of numerous books and published articles on the subject. His opponent for the affirmative will be Thaddeus Russell, a PhD history graduate from Columbia University who heads Renegade University and whose work has been published in multiple mainstream media channels. If you're in New York at the time, seeing these two scholars in a live debate is something you won't want to miss. The event will be held on July 15th at the Subculture Theatre on Bleecker Street, starting at 6.30pm, and seating must be reserved in advance. To reserve your spot, go to www.thesohoforum.org. Scroll down to the event on Monday, July 15th, and simply click on the Buy Tickets link. And while you're online, please give the podcast a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or Google Play, and follow us on our social networks at Open College Podcast. Now, back to the podcast. If we go back to the 1950s and the 1960s, we find first-rate philosophers, Michel Foucault, Richard Rorty, Jacques Derrida, and others, casting a very suspicious up eye upon the concept of truth, right? and I'm putting that in scare quotes, and who are substituting group relativized narratives, that there are just stories and there are multiple ones, and no one of them has a better claim to truth than any of the others. They then will go on to lament, in some cases, that those narratives are in brutal conflict right, with each other, and we have no way of resolving those conflicts by appealing to the traditional tools of reason, analysis, and argument because we are becoming skeptical of those. As a result, the way Richard Rorty puts it, we cannot escape right, our own, quote, ethnocentric predicament, unquote. And Rorty went on to claim that, you know, there is no way to get to the truth or any sort of objective thing, so all we can do is, quote, we must, in practice, privilege our own group, unquote. And of course, other groups are doing the same thing. They are privileging their narrative and their values, and if they're in conflict with each other, well, the result has to be rather brutal. Now, Rorty was trying to say we should not be too brutal down this road, just recognize our ethnocentric pr predicament, but in this first generation, he is identifying it as philosophically inescapable. Now, ethnocentric predicament is one possibility. Of course, it can be race group 
predicament. It can be sex and or gender group predicament. There are any number of social dimensions that we can see individuals as being trapped in and in conflict with the others. Now, that's the first step. If the truth is out and our predicament really is one of just racial, gender, ethnic group conflict, then what does this imply for the purpose of education? What's the, the next step going to be here? Well, Michel Foucault was quite explicit about the implications of the death of truth. He, uh, as a younger man, uh, had been a true believer in the communist truth, that one overarching meta-narrative. But he fell away from communism. He left the French Communist Party for a couple of reasons. One was, of course, the incredible rigidity of the party and the fact that the French Communist Party was taking marching orders from Moscow. But also, at this point, he was and had recently finished his PhDs in philosophy and in psychology, and those had left a stamp on him as well. But if truth in any capital T sense or any sense of objectivity or the idea that ultimately there's a one right or best answer is out, what are we then going to do? Well, at one point, uh, speaking somewhat autobiographically, he uh, speaks of his semi-mentor Jean-Paul Sartre, and he says, quote, Sartre, at this time, renounced all philosophical speculation, properly speaking, and invested his own philosophical activity in behavior that was political, unquote. That is to say, Sartre, uh, he noticed, was doing the same sort of thing that he Foucault was thinking about. If we're not doing philosophy for the sake of philosophy, with philosophy's traditional aims, what we might as well do that is renounce that and go straight to the politics. And we're only doing philosophy as a way of extending our political aspirations, whatever our political aspirations happen to be. Contemporary, very perceptive intellectual historian, Mark Lilla, writing of this era, 1950s and 1960s, talking about how many schools of philosophy abandoned their traditional understanding of what philosophy was about. And the way he put it this way was, quote, this is Mark Lilla's words now, politics dictated and philosophy wrote, unquote. So we get at best philosophy as a rationalization for previously non-objective, non-truth-based on fact-based commitments to normative positions. And that then dictates the second position, or rather the second step with respect to education. Education should be politicized. Now, what kind of politics, though, if we're going to politicize education? Well, for the first generation postmoderns, this is still 1950s, 1960s, Orthodox Marxism no longer really was tenable. So there was widespread movement on the left, that leftism needed to be fought after basically a century of dominance by, by Marxism and neo-Marxism, something more dramatic was going to be needed. But it was going to be something, as Jacques Derrida, the deconstructionist, put it this way. He said, we needed something, quote, in the spirit of Marxism, unquote, but without all of the clunky baggage of traditional Marxism. And so what we see is the kind of politicization that emerges is going to keep the Marxist themes of exploitation and oppression and its kind of relentless antagonism toward our current civilization, but it's going to abandon its faith in science, uh, its claim that economics is fundamental, and the traditional Marxist belief that kind of the inevitable march of history is going to bring about the revolution. So if we abandon traditional Marxism and those things, then what we are going to adopt instead is the idea that subversive action now, that's what we need in order to affect the transformation. Rather than waiting for the march of history to bring about the revolution, the revolution in whatever form it's going to take is something that we have to do by subversive action here and now. In Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, he writes an incredibly crafted and well-argued insight into what postmodernism is, why it exists, and why it is dangerous applied in the wrong dose, in the wrong place, as it frequently is in this day and age. Postmodernism has been the most vigorous intellectual movement of the late 20th century. 
In his book, Hicks traces the roots of postmodernism all the way back to the Enlightenment era, where he systematically charts how the age of reason sowed the seeds of unreason that was to follow, making a clear connection between postmodernism to history, leftist politics, and even the ugliness of contemporary art. Hicks presents his thesis with beautiful, easy to understand explanations that burn with logic and common sense. So if you've ever wondered why society holds so many assumptions about the world, and you want to understand the chaos of what is happening, Hicks's work in this book provides a huge piece to this puzzle. Why do skeptical and relativistic arguments have such power in the contemporary intellectual world? Why do they have that power in the humanities but not in the sciences? Why is a significant portion of the political left the same left that traditionally promoted reason, science, equality for all, and optimism, now switch to the themes of anti-reason, anti-science, double standards and cynicism. This book is by far the most helpful resource I have ever come across for understanding why the world is turning into a direction that I just can't comprehend. Pick up your copy of Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, available now on Amazon.com. While you're online, make sure to subscribe to the Open College podcast hosted by Stephen Hicks himself, and please leave a review for it on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now, the next generation of postmodernists got busy. Uh, they learned from Foucault, Rorty, and Derrida, right? If we summarize so far, that we should abandon truth for narratives. We should abandon the individual mind for group social construction. And we should politicize the classroom with some sort of quasi-Marxism or something in the spirit right, of Marxism, whatever that means. Then Herbert Marcuse of this generation, Jean-Francois Lyotard should be mentioned. What they are urging strategically then is rather than young leftists thinking of themselves as outside the system, revolutionaries who are going to impose the revolution, what they should do is position themselves inside the system, see themselves as part of the system, and to work within the system to affect the kind of change. We need to join the system's leading institutions and then, from inside positions of power, rework its core beliefs and its core ethos. And we see this then starting to manifest itself explicitly in the educational thought of the 70s and 1980s. Here I'll cite uh, Stanley Fish. At one point, Stanley Fish was uh, reminded of John Stuart Mill's claim that a, a good educator is going to present his own arguments, of course, but then also his opponent's arguments, and he'll present those arguments in their strongest form. And when he was reminded of this, Professor Fish said, quote, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. You don't want to build up your opponent's arguments. You want to squelch them, unquote. So that's the third step. You just don't present the rival positions, the rival alternatives, the competing hypotheses. And if they arise in your classroom or in your educational institution, you suppress them immediately. Now, one of Stanley Fish's postmodern colleagues at uh, Duke University, this is uh, Frank Lentricchia, then took the fourth step. If we now succeed, and this is, uh, we can start to see in the 80s and the 90s, things like, hey, ho, Western Civ has got to go, with the explicit point of abandoning and banishing from the syllabi and from reading lists all of the traditional works in, uh, in the Western civilization canon. So if we can get all of the competing and alternative viewpoints off the syllabus, then what are we supposed to be doing, especially if we're not engaged in truth-seeking anymore? The point is going to be about power. You as the teacher, you as the professor, you have social power now. You're a tenured professor, say. And so your job, this is Lentricchia's words now, are, quote, to exercise power for the purpose of social change, unquote. Yes, you're not interested in truth or the advancement of knowledge. You are interested in social activism. You want to change society, and that's your job. So the postmodern educator's task is to train students, quote, to spot, confront, and work against the political horrors of one's time, unquote. 
So we take it as axiomatic that we are living in an oppressive society, an exploitative society, a terrible society, an alienating society, all of that in the spirit of Marxism language. And the horrors are spread across many dimensions with many victims. And your job then as a teacher is relentlessly to help students be aware of those things, to teach them to stand up to those things, and to work in an activist fashion against all of those things. So your job is now explicitly to train activists, and particularly angry activists who are going to do something about it. Friedrich Nietzsche was famous for his statement that God is dead and his provocative account of master and slave moralities, and also for the fact that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis claimed that Nietzsche was one of their great inspirations. Were the Nazis right to do so? Or did they misappropriate Nietzsche's philosophy? Professor Stephen Hicks's concisely written book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, based on the 2006 documentary, corrects many widespread misconceptions about Nietzsche, giving a fascinating and easy to understand analysis of Nietzsche's work, asking and answering a number of questions, such as what were the key elements of Hitler and the National Socialist political philosophy? How did the Nazis come to power in a nation as educated and civilized as Germany? What was Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy? The philosophy of live dangerously, and that which does not kill us makes us stronger? And to what extent did Nietzsche's philosophy provide a foundation for the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis? Professor Hicks demonstrates his mastery of this subject using quotes and critical analysis that prove his points and show the true linkage between Nietzsche and the Nazis, and how philosophical ideas move the world. Get your copy of Nietzsche and the Nazis by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com today. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast hosted by Hicks himself on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now I can't resist, uh, as we're getting to, um, toward the end of this here, say more explicitly, obviously this has uh, implications for not only what's going to be on the syllabus or what's going to be on the reading list, what kind of professors we are going to hire, but then also when we are, is, say, in professional schools of education, training the next generation of teachers, what will the, the, the content of teacher training be like? But if we're thinking about the particular kinds of students that we are trying to train, it's one thing to say, well, we're interested in aware, critical, angry activists, but the uh, language that is used increasingly in the last couple of years is that of a virus. Now, this is partly, of course, inspired by internet meme language and things going viral socially, but I've got tier two professors from Arizona State University who are speaking explicitly about the purpose of their kind of postmodern pedagogy. And what they mean is not something quite as benign simply as an internet meme. What they are urging forthrightly as a, quote, pedagogical priority, unquote, is that we train students to, quote, serve as viruses that infect, unsettle, and disrupt traditional and entrenched fields, unquote. Now, this is not simply there's a catchy or interesting meme that goes viral and it makes people laugh or smile and, or whatever on the internet. The kind of viruses that, uh, this is Professor Foz and Professor Carger are mentioning, are Ebola and HIV. And both of these viruses are, of course, ones that infect their hosts, render its immune system weaker, and then destroy it from within. So that's what we're trying to do with the students. And in their view, tacking on again some in the spirit of Marxism kind of language, they believe that we live in a mindless and capitalist consumer culture and that universities have sold themselves out to corporations. And so this is all perfectly the right activist. Now the point of this is that this explains our current generation of angry young people who are coming out of schools, coming out of universities with all of their inchoate energy and fears and rage. Release from 12, 15, 16 years of such schooling, they only want to do something now. 
but what? You know, they can just feel in their bones because this is what they have been taught, this is what has been instilled in them, that the system that they are entering into is oppressive, that they personally are being set up for failure by sinister forces who just hate them or loathe them because of their gender or their race or their ethnicity. Everybody basically loathes everybody and that they have a life of conflict ahead of them. And they have not been exposed much to other ideologies nor trained how to evaluate them nor how to think for themselves as individuals. Thrust unprepared into a hostile world, it makes perfect sense that their protests are simply going to be manifestations of their own internal rages and despairs. Now, once again, I'd like to return to the theme of this series that philosophy is practical. And the results of applying postmodern theory to educational practice for two generations now, that is the great lesson of our time. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favorite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher.